Our next lead speaker was a former commanding general for the Maneuver Center of Excellence, the former First Special Forces Operational Detachment Delta Commander, who served as the final commander of NATO's Resolute Support Mission Afghanistan. He has served in numerous combat tours in Iraq, Afghanistan, Bosnia and Herzegovina, Honduras, Mogadishu, and has served in numerous command and staff positions over his 37-year military career. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to present General Retired Scott Miller. It's pretty cool to be back here at Fort Benning. I already got counseled on my choice of civilian attire. I'm supposed to apparently have a uh, jacket and uh, some suede shoes, and I kind of treated it the way I treated most of my military career. I was going to do what I wanted to do. The, uh, and, uh, and we're retired. Actually, a couple of the guys are retired up here. Hey, let me tell you something. Uh, Curtis Buzzer and I go back a little ways, and he asked me to come down here and talk to you uh, about the Maneuver Warfighter Conference, particularly about combat. And uh, you know, as I thought about it, I was like, hey, cool, someone's asked me to do something. Uh, come back and uh, you know, be an old guy and talk. And then I realized, but you're an old guy. And you look out here, and uh, you know, some of you I probably got 35, maybe 36, 37 years on. And I thought maybe it'd be a little bit, uh, maybe it'll blend the old with a little bit more contemporary. So I built a panel. Now I'm going to tell you something about this panel. It's, uh, it's, it's one, it's a group of, uh, it's a real group of war fighters. And I'm going to make them do something they're not comfortable doing. I told them what their responsibility was is pick any war story. I don't care. It can be the last, uh, somewhere in the last 30 years. And uh, talk about it for just a couple minutes to set the scene. And it's a there I was moment, which none of us like, well, somebody likes out here likes doing that, but none of these guys like doing that. And I said, your only requirement is you owe the lieutenants, the sergeants, and the captains two to three lessons learned to walk away with. You know, real lessons learned. We didn't rehearse it. They may overlap. They may be common, you know, pretty common. They may be very common sense. But sometimes when you hear something over and over from people that have gone through a uh, pretty difficult fight in the past, you go, well, maybe this is a real lesson. Maybe this is something to uh, collapse on. Um, I, I suspect that somebody's already mentioned the passing of um, General Grange, or Dave Grange, the elder. Um, I'll just tell you what a, what a phenomenal leader, mentor he was. I'd, you know, the younger guys, I'd encourage you to get out there and look at those uh, pictures, and you see him as kind of a steely-eyed maneuver center, or actually infantry commandant at the time. Uh, he was my commandant when I went through uh, airborne school in 1981, and I had the great fortune of having him grab me. You know, he's in his he's in his early 90s, and he's going, Scott, let's meet somewhere between Carlisle and Gettysburg, and uh, just grab some lunch. And every time I was up in D.C., I'd get a chance to sit down and just absorb that mentorship. Um, but the you know, United States of America, certainly the uh, you know the military, the maneuver force has lost a uh, great mentor. So again, read about him, take some time to figure out what he was all about. You may have something else here to learn as well. Okay, very quickly, because we're on a timeline, and I'll go as long as we need to go. Uh, and I'm serious, if you guys have questions, we're gonna get to questions, and I wanna hear, you know, think about them. You know, don't sit there and get uh, bashful. I'm a little more direct than Charlie was. Uh, it's not kindergarten adult. I just tell you, I can sit here and stare you down until you ask a question, and, and you'll get more uncomfortable than I will up here. The, um, but this is a good panel, and two of the guys have to uh, swing back over to their headquarters because they got the SEC Army coming through. So I'm going to kick off with them. But I've got the uh, contemporary. That's the Ranger Regimental Leadership, J.D. Kersey and Brett Johnson. And I can tell you, as somebody who is now out of the military, you know what an honor it was to be able to serve with them while I was in the military through multiple grades, by the way, not just in uh, current current uh, you know ranks. And watching them, and uh, you know, just knowing that this, uh, you know, this army, this Ranger Regiment, you know, the future is very, very bright when I see leaders like this. But they're gonna, you know, represent, you know, the here and now at Fort Benning. People you can reach out and touch all the time, and they're available. If you don't take advantage of it, it's uh, it's your loss. They're available. Rob Phipps, the famous Rob Phipps, retired Master Sergeant. He's uh, again dressed in uh, inappropriate civilian attire, just like myself. And uh, Rob is a um, longtime ranger, uh, still active in national security matters, uh, but uh, one of these guys that uh, I had the opportunity to share a battlefield with uh, actually a couple times over the years, and one I know is a you know, tremendous warrior. 
Uh, Mr. Dan Gelada, CW5, Dan Gelada, 40 years of service. Uh, retired about, it was 2016 when he retired. And I remember sitting there going to his retirement ceremony, actually officiating at it and talking. And he came up and he goes, I'd do another 40. He didn't want to get out. And you can see another guy that stayed in the fight uh, even after he departed. This is a really good panel up here. I'd encourage you, have, you know, particularly the young guys, have some questions ready to go. You know, it gets down to the essence. The future is important. All of us, all the leaders in here are required to think about it. Some people are actually working on it all the time. All of us have to think about it, but never, ever forget. There's accountability for the here and now, right now. You know, if, we're not, if it's not 2030 and we get in a fight, don't say, gee, I wish I had the 2030 tools. You're going as you are right now, and I think you're going to find some of those uh, key principles still apply. But uh, Brett, up to you. All right, sir. Thanks, uh, and, and appreciate everybody for allowing me to sit, sit up here uh, into the breach. Right. So, uh, you know, the boss asked me, hey, I want you to do something, talk about a combat war story. I will tell you, the, the first thing that came to my mind wasn't, wasn't some faraway land in Afghanistan or Iraq. Uh, it was more, more the people. So I, the first name that came to my mind was, was, uh, was Chris Salise. And some, some of you may know, know him and just recent Medal of Honor recipient. And, you know, we just actually just put his, his uh, picture up in our, in our halls in our organization. So the, th the things that I think about aren't the acts that he did that day to save the team, to save the pilots, to take off with our, our wounded partners. It was the things that he did prior to all leading up to there. So I'll talk about a couple things, and, and really, as we talk warrior ethos, is the character of the, of the person that we look for in our army to lead our folks. So I was, I was with a battalion commander one day, and, and we're, we're going through a live fire, and there's a saw gunner that is just going to town on his saw, just, just doing malfunction drill after malfunction drill, and he gets it back up. It's in the middle of the night. He's sweaty. His nods are fogged over. His glasses are fogged over. And the battalion commander looks down and says, I, I hope that I'm, I'm as good at my job as that, that E4 is on his saw right now. And my hope is that my platoon leaders are as good at their job as, as he is at his. And I, and I want to make sure that my company commanders are as good as they are at their job as that as that sergeant is at his level. And so what are we doing to get after that and to make sure they're as good as they can be for like America's sons and daughters? And so it, it fast forwarded in my head as I, as I thought back to that day, as I, I sat the board before we, we pushed it up through the command uh, for, his, for his award and, and just read through that entire thing and, and the character that Chris Salise had and the training, and every person that you talk to and you go back is how every day he showed up. By the way, he was a 12 Bravo in the, in the 75th Ranger Regiment. A 12 Bravo, so he was an 11 Bravo. He was chosen to do a very special mission with some folks and, uh, and did it day in and day out and trained his butt off every single day. And, and what, what struck me as powerful is at 6 o'clock in the morning, he got up out of bed, he did his physical fitness training, and then he had his all the skills and the things that they needed to do to be successful as they went forward. And they did that every single day. And not, and not just to like a standard, like we got a TP and a U, they did it over and over and over again. Because he knew when he got called upon that he would be the guy that needed to make those hard calls. And that day, they had multiple wounded and had to get the, the casualties out of there in the middle of the daylight. And he put himself in between the pilot and the, and the small arms fire and saved the pilot's life and uh, allowed them to exfil and then wave the pilot off. Multiple acts of valor that day, as you, you remember that very well, sir. And it just sticks in my mind as the character leader that he was and that we aspire to be every day. And I would just ask that we don't get comfortable as leaders at, at any echelon that we go to. And when you wake up, you're, you're like, hey, how can I be a better version of myself today than I was yesterday? It doesn't matter if you're in training or, or in combat. It, what matters is the example that you set and the standard that you set with your organization, with your NCOs, with your, with your platoon leaders, your company commanders, is we should expect them to be just as good as that saw gunner in the middle of the night when he's doing a drum change. <clears throat> sir? Hey, sir. Sir, thanks for uh, inviting us to share this panel with uh, you know, people we've looked up to for our whole uh, period of service. And obviously we drew, and I think Rob's going to talk about it, kind of the way we train the Ranger Regiment since uh, before I got there. Um, 
from the big five coming out of the Mogadishu experience. And I don't think it's ever uh, too early. Uh, it's probably gonna pretty soon get too late for us to reflect the same way in the last 20 years of GWAT and what it means for the Army at 2030 and kind of the way going forward. And a lot of it's stuff that you know, General Rainey, General Martin, and others were touching on, the SMA and the uh, CSA. And that's small unit stuff that we're seeing in Ukraine that's gonna carry the day. And I can't tell a personal story because Adam Nash is in the room, will call me out. Brett, you're right here. Sergeant Torres, Sergeant Lucero. Every unit I've ever been in, there's a non-commissioned officer from that unit in the room right now. So this is called uh, high risk, low reward to tell a personal story. So I'm gonna share one, sir, from, uh, that recently inspired me. I was out at 1st Battalion, they're doing the anniversary of Takar Gar. And the story of Takar Gar is one of the, uh, kind of the events that pulled me into the Ranger Regiment um, right before I went to Rope, where a rope instructor uh, crushed my face metaphorically to make me a better Ranger. The, uh, so Takar Gar, many of you are familiar with it. I'm gonna hit wave top stuff because it's gonna get down to mission command and discipline initiative and, and what it really means because those are uh, three syllable words and three syllable words are often I know mission command is two two syllable words, but three syllable words are often misinterpreted and we get too abstract when we're thinking about it. And this is really for how we see SLC and uh, their career course out there. In Takar Gar, um, we had an element isolated on the top of the mountain, in contact, QRF went in for all the wrong, with, without the situational awareness it needed, without the relative superiority we owe our, our troops, rangers, soldiers, and we put them on the ground. All that stuff failed, so it was up to small unit tactics, uh, character, and trust to save the day. The relief force put in 10,000 feet below, too, too far away to get there immediately, and they immediately received conflicting orders. Someone from outside their chain of command who outranked them said, no, do this other thing. Someone else will take care of your people. But they could hear the guns on the top of the hill, and they, uh, in the absence of orders, in fact, countered orders, tailored their load to make the climb, and got up there to the top, and when Lieutenant Self, the platoon leader, IOBC graduate, looked and saw his squad uh, coming to relieve him, he said, I knew you'd come, and he put them where they needed to be to, to suppress the enemy. And they did the first uh, DOD air to ground, hellfire strike, danger close. They brought in uh, fast movers. Um, they won the day, they, they recovered the casualties, they secured cure, the site, and it was, a, uh, it was a squad leader and his squad that moved in the uh, seize day that day. And we talked, you know, kind of, in the abstract about the NCO Corps and what it means. When we talk about mission command, it only extends through the US Army because we've got you know, a singular platoon leader, a singular company commander, and they develop trust. And I really, the really lesson is, in talking to the guys who were involved in that, is how did you have the trust? How did you know they were gonna be there? And it came from the same things, not to be a beat a dead horse, shared hardship. So for today's generation, and, and for me personally, that means anytime you're clackety clacking on a computer, you're probably in the wrong spot. You need to get out there and share some hardship. That means forcing folks to connect with each other, and that's tougher today. When we put a part of our hive mind into these uh, phones and people are staring at it. Um, so you gotta design your day around things that will accelerate trust with the unit. So if you're a new, uh, new platoon sergeant coming out of SLC, new, new uh, lieutenant going to a unit, company commander, you know, a best practice would be rush to that first event where you can share hardship uh, because the person in the office isn't the person they want leading them. They want someone who's in and amongst them. And then, you know, since I got uh, the mic, haven't passed yet, you should also graduate Ranger School while you're here. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name's Rob Phipps. Uh, I ended up here today because General Miller has this habit of calling me out of the blue and asking me to do things like this. Uh, sometimes when he's in Afghanistan and I'm in Iraq, and uh, it's hard to tell him no. Uh, Gosh, where to start? Um, I guess my story would start with uh, 1993 in Mogadishu. I was a young corporal team leader at that time, so to tell you that I knew something would be a lie. Uh, I learned most of my lessons afterward as I had time to reflect upon them and look back on all the lessons learned from that, and I'm still learning lessons today from that day. Uh, fast forward through my time in the Ranger Regiment, you know, squad leader, platoon sergeant, first sergeant, on and on. Uh, I tried to take those lessons learned and apply them to the units that I was with so that we didn't have to repeat the lessons learned from that day. Uh, whether that was from the individual level to the team level, squad level, and platoon level, that's where the fight's going to happen. And focusing a majority of your time and effort and your resources and as a command element on ensuring that those individuals can focus a majority of their time on that individual team squad and then platoon collective uh, is really gonna do you justice down the road. Uh, it served the Ranger Regiment well with its big five, 
Uh, they focus majority of their training path at the individual team, squad, and collective, and then they bring it together with the C2 pieces at platoon, company, uh, and battalion level. But that's really where that stuff's gonna benefit you. And yes, share hard times. Get out there with your people. Do the things that you expect them to do and be able to do them as well as they do, hopefully. Uh, back in the day in the Army, we had this thing, be no do, all right? Be the leader that they deserve, all right? Know the things that you expect them to know, hopefully to the level they know them, but they are the subject matter experts in those fields, all right? And then be willing to do everything that you expect your people to do so that we don't have to lose those lessons learned throughout the GWAT and other conflicts and apply them to what you guys are doing today. Uh, with that being said, I thank you guys for everything that you do today and that you're willing to do tomorrow. And I'm glad as a retiree, I didn't get the memo about the black polo. So. Hi, good afternoon, uh, Dan Gelato. So um, again, as General Miller said, you have a very unique uh, group of people out here and we are gonna give you time to ask questions. So ask hard questions and uh, think about them before you go. You know, and, and in 1993, most of you out there, 29 years ago, most of you out there were probably not born, you know, but you have to understand that it was the longest sustained fight since Vietnam. And uh, the individual heroic acts of that day by the uh, guys on the ground, the guys in the air, the guys back at the FOB, the medics, the docs, uh, the 101st came down to haul bodies, you know, um, back to the cache. Just the individual acts of that day will be forever in my brain. You have to understand that <clears throat> that was the seventh time we were out, and uh, we did not plan for that to happen. So when, when the first aircraft went down, um, all the training and all the preparation and all the focus started changing. And individuals thought outside the box, and they fixed the problem, right? They had issues going on, and, uh, and uh, if it wasn't for those people thinking outside the box, raising concerns up to the command, and uh, the command making decisions that uh, basically got everybody out of there, um, we would not have been as successful as I think we were, General Miller thinks we were. Um, it, was a, it was a hard day for us but it was a very successful day for us. Um, I'm gonna leave you with three different thoughts. And <clears throat> one is, I want you to look to your left and right. Now, please, Rangers. All right, those are the most important people in your life right now. And someone said um, about training, um, you owe those guys and gals to be the best trained um, clerk, best trained gunner, best trained lieutenant, best trained PL, company commander, battalion commander, that you can possibly be. This is a hard army, all right? You guys are hardened soldiers, all right? The second lesson I'll tell you is you have to do something hard every day. Weakness is a disease. Softness is a disease in your world. So you do something hard every day. And I'm going to tell you right now, everybody out there knows what is, what is hard for them. One more push-up. One more sit-up, you know, one, one more meter on the throw or one more second on the, um, what do you call it, sir, the knee hang these days, what, whatever PT test you're doing. <laughs> I'm going to tell you right now, everybody knows what's hard, all right? But if you don't focus on what's hard and get better at what's hard, you're going to get into that diseased area of being a soft person. And lastly, I'll tell you, uh, there's a thing getting pushed out on social media, and yes, even the old man gets into social media, uh, about no one's coming. No one's coming to get you off the couch. Um, no one's coming to, to do more PT. No one's coming to get you off your phone and get outside and, and, and have a scrimmage, a football game. No one's coming to do anything for you except for you. No one's coming for the next promotion. No one's coming for your next career move, all right? So focus on you. Focus on your squad, focus on your level, and do the very best job you can. Very proud of you guys and gals. So I have 1455. I actually threatened all of them because I know them. They all tend to go along with their war stories. They went real short today. 
you know, because we did want to get to some uh, Q&A. And I was actually hoping they'd go long, and I'd say, I'll give back my time. And you, you notice none of them would talk personally about what they did. Um, there is a uh, tremendous amount of valor, an individual valor, on their parts and the associated uh, decorations. You know, Dan Gelada is a guy who um, flew his helicopter in an emergency infill into Mogadishu. Uh, just happened to have a, uh, some ISR overhead. We caught the uh, main rotor blades, taking an RPG hit right in the main rotor blades. Aircraft shutter starts falling apart. He's got people on the rope, lifts up, sets back down. Rob, weren't you one of the guys on the rope that uh, Mr. Gelada settled in there and made sure you were in there? Let's them get down off the rope. Every instinct is get out of there. He pulls it out of there and goes crash lands it somewhere in the safe part of the city. Um, Rob Phipps running around on the uh, CSAR aircraft in the middle of a desperate gunfight, uh, trying to fight off guys, multiple uh, attackers, you know, within feet, you know, coming around trying to get to a downed aircraft. And uh, Rob Phipps and his team are in the, you know, right there in the midst of it. And fortunately, a very good shooter because Rob is now starting to kill a lot of the people that are trying to get to that uh, that crash site and uh, awarded for valor for that action as well. Brett tries to hide, Brett and JD will always try to hide things from me. You know, Brett run around as a sergeant major and in battalion and, uh, you know, making sure I don't know what he's, maybe he thinks, maybe I'll think he's too close to the action or something, I don't know. But he's in there pulling guys out in the middle of a big firefight and his battalion commander's uh, putting him in for a word for valor. J.D. Kersey, same thing, okay? This is, uh, you know, so I get that part. They don't want to talk. So I'll tell you a war story. So there I was, all right, middle of a uh, big, there's only a couple live witnesses for this one, so I'll be okay. I don't have any of my former NCOs in here. The, uh, it's Mogadishu, okay? We're in the middle of a, a big fight, 3 October. And uh, as a uh, young ca younger captain uh, moving down the street, uh, I moved down that street with absolute amazement, moving from a target seized to a downed helicopter, probably about 500 meters. That's it, 500 meters. But what my amazement was was not my valor or what I was, and I guess I was glad I was still moving, but the, uh, was watching all the things going on around me. The non-commissioned officers, the privates, the specialists, which I think you were a specialist at the time, Rob, if I'm not mistaken, watching them in action. Um, I mean, picture this. Helicopters are being shot down. We've got, you know, pretty hard wounded in action, like real hard, not superficial, but we have some really, you know, bad cases, uh, emergent. Um, we have MIAs over the course of the night, uh, multiple aircraft down, so you, you know, and, kill, and KIAs, KIAs dropping in our formation. So some of you have been in some of these over the years and you just know those make for a uh, pretty difficult day, or in our case, about a day and a half. And what my amazement was, was not all the individual war stories, it was the uh, absolute valor that was displayed. And I scratched my head over the, you know, over, not over the course of just that day, but in the years since, and I thought about it a lot. Because when I went home, our families were all very much worried about us. They'd seen a lot of this, had made it onto TV, some of the, uh, some of the, uh, some of the worst scenes that you can imagine in combat if you're losing people where people aren't accounted for, they're being drugged through the street. So this is all on TV and it was all in our family's minds. And uh, I remember my wife and I sitting down and talking about it. And what I said is, I, I said, I know this is a hard unit for you to be in. I know it's a hard, hard to support it. It's kind of, you know, it's difficult. And you do know if something happens in the future, we're going to get the call and we're going to go do it. You know, we're going to get asked to go do something that's usually not easy. But at the same time, what I also told her was I had a sense of peace because I absolutely knew that no matter what happened to me, unscathed, wounded, killed, I knew I was coming home. I knew that. And you can say, well, everybody says it. No one, no one leaves anybody behind. Sometimes someone gets left behind or something gets left behind. But I knew that it was not going to happen. And what I came up with was this thought, and it's culture, really. This is something for you to think about in your units. And you go, well, is it my job? I'm just a sergeant. I'm just a lieutenant. I'm just the captain. You know, is it my job to create this culture? But the culture was extreme trust. 
you guys talked about trust. I call it extreme trust. And extreme trust is, you know, Scott, Jim, and I will always uh, trust each other. We've served together. Ted, same thing. We've served together, and we got this, this trust. Extreme trust is where someone's willing to give up everything for you, and they may not even know you that well. They may not even know you. This is a mixed unit. Rangers, some special mission unit guys, some Air Force guys. I heard someone saying they hadn't gotten a chance to train with the Navy. I got a chance to. We had some Navy, Navy on the ground that day, had some aviators, and everybody was willing to kind of put it all on the line for somebody else. I had the opportunity to go back to Bragg over Memorial Day, and we had a series of upgrades. And it was uh, to the Dis Distinguished Service Cross, which, as you know, is just short of the Medal of Honor. There were silver stars, and I think we had four that were upgraded. And I'll tell you the thing that jumped out at me when you started really remembering what that all was about. It's about somebody going into a beaten zone. Both my armor and infantry know what a beaten zone is, right? It's not a place you want to go running into. You want to create a lot of beaten zones. You don't want to go in there. Going into a beaten zone and pulling somebody out, dead or alive. Just getting them out of there because they knew they couldn't. If they weren't dead, they weren't going to survive if they stayed in that beaten zone. Over and over and over. Helicopter pilots coming in and risking their aircraft and their entire crew to drop off a resupply. And when you talk to them afterwards, you go, what the hell were you doing? They go, hey, I, didn't know, I wanted to get this so close because I didn't want to have you or anybody else have to get out in the street to pick this up. You know, again, somebody sitting on an aircraft, that it's done. This aircraft's on fire. Sitting on an aircraft on the controls and it's starting to do, make some really funny noises, bad vibrations. Sorry, Rob, we've got to get you at least on the ground before we take off. That's extreme trust. And, uh, you know, it doesn't start on the day. It starts somewhere else. It starts before that day. And you need to think about that. And uh, some of you will serve in good units. Some of you will serve in great units. Some of you will lead good units. Some of you will lead great units. The culture of trust has got to be in there. I'm huge on fitness, okay? None of these guys mentioned it, but they are too, and they meant it. You know, when I, when I talk about 500 meters, I'm just telling you, I was tired. I was tired. I was thirsty. Wasn't that, didn't have too much kit on, but I, I didn't know how much I had left in the gas tank when I got from point A to point B. And I wasn't in bad condition. Uh, and what I, was, you know, said to myself from that point on, now I'm going for it. I am going for it because I just watched the fittest, just did the best that day, every day. Shooting, lethality, we'll talk a little bit more about it. You know, I'm a huge believer, if you're gonna take a shot, you ought to kill what you're shooting at. You ever seen tank gunnery? They screw up tank gunnery, somebody's getting in trouble. I would like to see in the infantry that we had the same kind of mindset when it came to just basic rifle marksmanship. I've always said, I said, if we can't shoot expert sitting in static positions at distance with targets that don't move, they just pop up, there's an exposure. If we can't shoot expert then, when do we want to start doing the moving live fires? I'd like to get that first part right, right off the bat. It all starts right here. Like I said, with the beauty of Fort Benning, and this is not to marginalize the majors, lieutenant colonels, the colonels, the brigadiers, the major generals, the lieutenant generals that are present here. But we all care about lieutenants, sergeants, captains. We got our drill sergeants working on the privates. But I guarantee you, if you get the lieutenants, the captains, and the sergeants right, by the time we pull the privates in there, we'll make them great. We will. All right, I'm stopping right there. Remember, we got, I think we, uh, is Curtis in here? I haven't seen him. General Buzzard, you in here? Ah, oh, he got pulled. Okay, who's the senior one from Benny? All right, we got the infantry commandant in here. That's just as good. All right, so you guys keep us honest here. We'll go as long as we can. Just remember, JD and Brett have to get back over to the uh, headquarters to handle the SEC Army. Over to you guys for questions. Over to question holder number three. Hello, 
all gentlemen. Ooh. Uh, First Lieutenant Worth over at A Bullock. So my question is, when you're in the middle of adversity, and we've all acknowledged that danger and death are part of this job, but when you're fighting and leading through adversity, how do you continue through um, when you have like a KIA or a casualty within your unit without being cold or losing empathy for that soldier that has been wounded? Uh, hey, sir, that's, that's a great question. You know, I think we, we started to talk about it at the beginning where it starts. Like I, I'm a true believer that like leadership and, and extreme trust starts at, at, at zero six every day when the, when the platoon leader and platoon sergeant have a formation. And I'll get to your KAA stuff in a second. And, and that's when it starts. And we, we, we're holding each other accountable to the things we're doing every day because we, we know that like what lies ahead is not going to be easy. You know, it's not, it's not going to be easy. Uh, and so then, as you build the trust over time, you, you know you're going to go and, like, bad things happen. Just yesterday, Tim Shea's parents, William and Mary, walk into the regimental headquarters office, uh, and they haven't been back for 17 years. 17 years. They, they, walk, they walk in the regimental headquarters, and uh, the staff duty comes up and says, hey, uh, there's a, there's a gold star family that's out, out outside, and uh, they, they would just want to talk to somebody. We walked up, and uh, there they are, William and Mary Shea. Uh, he was a 3rd Battalion Ranger, actually, in BICO 375, was killed in 2005 in Iraq. And uh, all, all they cared about was looking to see if we remember. That's all they cared about. They, they, they cared about seeing us, but they want to see their son's face. They want to know that we remember the sacrifice that he gave to our country. And then we took him to the battalion, and all they want to see is the picture of, of Corporal Timothy Shea uh, up on the wall and know that we remember and we never forget. Because Miss Joyce Thomas at 375 doesn't forget, and she writes a letter every, every month or every, every year. And then, uh, and then go down to BCO 375, the same company that we were just talking about. Go down to BCO 375, walk upstairs, and there's the picture, amongst many others, over time, was Corporal Timothy Shea. And what I will tell you is, as a, as a leader of formation, then when you lose somebody, uh, it's, it's not going to be easy, and everybody grieves in, in different manners and different ways. Uh, but it's the tough, realistic training that you do and the standards and discipline that you apply to your organization that will help you get through the toughest of times. Uh, you know, when you, when you go out to do your training and you, and you jump into the field and it's a long week and you're tired and everybody's tired and you want to get on that bus to come back and it's 12 miles, sometimes that walk is a little bit better. You got to bring the team together and you just got to talk about it. And, you know, the Army has resources, all those other things. That's, that's good. You should do all those things. But it starts at 06 when you lead your folks every single day and set the example for others to follow. That's what I would say to that, sir. Um, you know, parts of a, of a personal story on this one. Um, fairly horrific incident in Baghdad. I was company commander. We suffered 5K on a mission I was on, and I accompanied the uh, K to the, to the hospital. Took it, um, I'm not trying to wave the bloody flag here or anything, but you know, I, I felt like my position was to conduct the, the medevac. We had some expectant with us, and I was there kind of in the midst of the casualty situation. Um, and it took the whole team kind of looking and providing feedback. And, and my first sergeant called up to me and said, hey, hey, sir, I know you're up there. I know you're you're waiting for everything to, to settle out there, but we really need you to come back to the uh, to the company, to the fob we were on, because we, we were working on some follow-on stuff. It was very busy. And I couldn't see that I was overcommitted um, and kind of out of position for the rest of the company. It took that that best, you know, battle buddy to help me see myself and kind of give me that kind of counsel. And I don't know if you're going to see it in a situation you're describing because it's extremely high stress or your uh, senior enlisted advisor you're working with or one of your platoon leaders won't see it. But as a team, we can help each other see and be in the right spot, and that's also part of trust. And that doesn't, uh, that doesn't degrade you. You should be able to count on somebody else in the unit to help you see yourself and make sure you're not out of position and you can still lead from uh, from where you got to be. Hey, like, like the Sergeant Major said, good question. Um, 
the uh, a death in combat is probably the most difficult thing you got to deal with. Um, but you know, when you have a death in combat, um, you, especially if it's a friend of yours, you will continue to fight um, and execute your mission as best you can. And then <clears throat> fast forward, I'll tell you, Sergeant Major brought up a good point about taking care of the families. Um, that's one. But also, I stayed in active duty for a lot of years after that because I, I continued to train and I continued to learn and I continued to battle and fight the fight for friends of mine that died in 1993. So oftentimes, you, you mourn the loss of an individual friend when you're there, but then you fight the fight to better yourself in their memory. I just want to hop on what Dan said about that. Uh, a very good example about that, too, is the Smith family. Uh, and I'm sure everyone knows the story of Black Hawk Down, so I'm not going to waste your time with that. Uh, but when Jamie Smith died, he had a wound that at that time we were not prepared to handle in the way that we are today. Uh, the regiment has a program, the RFR, the Ranger First Responder course, and a lot of the trauma medicine within the soft community uh, was born in the lessons learned from Mogadishu that day. Uh, when the Smith family came down periodically to visit, much like the Shea family, because they just want to know that their son's death wasn't in vain uh, and that we remember and that we've taken the lessons learned from that situation and applied them to what we're doing today. Uh, we took them through the full RFR program and gave them a, an A to Z brief on everything that the unit now does, specifically from lessons learned from the sacrifice he made that day and how many thousands of people we're probably saved from lessons learned from that one individual in that one day on the ground. Uh, and then the last thing I'll leave you with, sir, to your question is, how do I deal with a situation or how would I have dealt with a situation with a death in combat? Because I know that they would do it for me. And if you build that camaraderie at 06 through hard PT and that they know that you will never leave them, no matter what, that you're coming home every time, the investment that you make in your people, your people will make in you. So we, we won't uh, try to, that you can tell that's an important question to everybody on this panel, probably a lot of people in this room. Um, I'm just gonna boil it right down. Casually suck, they do. Uh, wounded is bad, hard wounded is worse. Killed in action, when you lose your people, that's the absolute worst, uh, but you're a leader. And uh, everybody's gonna be looking to you to how this organization is going to respond to it. Uh, but it, they suck, and that's the best way I can describe it. You know, quite frankly, if I never had to go to another memorial service, I'd be okay with that. Just would be. You know, not for that. Um, you know, and what I always tell people is uh, you get yourself into very unfair fights, meaning we have all the odds on our side, so that they have the casualties on their side and we don't have them on ours. But uh, they're tough. Leadership will carry you through that. Leadership and trust. And that's, a, uh, that's, that's important to remember. Um, and I actually, Tim Shea, I remember Tim, Tim Shea was on my account too, uh, killed in Al-Qaim in 2005, getting ready to move out. Uh, it's a catastrophic IED blast, and certainly Jamie Smith. And if I'd known his parents had come there, next time they come, please pass my regards well. Tell them we all still remember, okay? That, that, that time, there's no time limit on that. All right, back out to you guys. Over to panel holder number one. Good afternoon, group. My name is Lieutenant Colonel Mallon. I'm an Army Reservist. I'm assigned to U.S. Forces Korea. I live in California. Um, I came out here today, and I'm grateful for this warrior ethos class. Um, a thing that we need to know as leaders and soldiers, I, I fought in the Army since I was a private, all the way up to Lieutenant Colonel. And over the years, in the decades that have passed, soldiers need to be recognized for when they fight. If they're, if they're the, the smallest guy to the biggest guy, to the paratrooper. After they get home from these battles years later, their families need to know they've been recognized. And for your group, it took 25 years to get these Valor Awards fixed. And I, I commend you all for that, to getting it done. Um, I've tried over the years to get other people's awards done, and I'm always hit with the, uh, the Army, the Records Board, or the Army's Valor Board, or the Awards Board. There's always some hiccup to get soldiers recognized for the work they do and how they represent our country. It just In the future, as we go into great war, we, we need to 
recognize all these soldiers as they perform for our country and do their best jobs. I wanted to wait to address this issue until I retired because it, it's, it's a sticklet. So please, when your soldiers perform, award them. Take care of them. Your families will thank you for it in the end. Gentlemen, Captain Mark Tisler, MCCC. Uh, gentlemen, each of you have worked with joint and international partners on numerous occasions throughout your career. What is one lesson that each of you have drawn from those experiences? So there's uh, room for interpretation up here because the acoustics on the stage are very bad for questions. General Martin warned me about it. The uh, sounds like lessons from joint partners. So I'm just going to use a lesson I already want to talk about in my book. The uh, GFCs, and this applies to joints too, and this is over the last 20 years, ground force commander or ground force commander equivalents matter. Um, having someone responsible with the expectations they're going to deliver with the authorities to do what they've got to do matters. And we use the term ground force commander uh, where we work because the joint players all understand it. Um, and it's kind of known across uh, the international community too. They don't want to know if it's platoon commander or platoon leader or company commander. They just want to know who, who has the authority to get stuff done. Um, and so something we've seen over 20 years is if you give someone extremely high expectations like the, a platoon leader or a company commander, then you give them the means to do something about it, they'll deliver results. Um, and that kind of carries across a joint special operations, joint international community. Uh, but it's something I would just caution ourselves against if we look at Army 2030. Uh, every time we pool a capability up to a higher echelon, company commanders may have less capability to do it. And I know it's, it's not really the truth in the way, like it's not all being pooled at core and division or anything like that. The unit of action will still be things that companies are responsible for. And I challenge company commanders uh, and platoon leaders in this forum to be the best there is of, what, of those that do it um, in any kind of setting at the authorities and capabilities you expect to bring to the fight. And don't get confused by the, any, the abstract of what might be happening at Corps and Division. And it's your responsibility to shape the environment through all domains for your, uh, for your platoons or know how to leverage someone else to do it. Not expecting you to fly a jet uh, and, and you know, fly that jet and deliver missiles, but I do expect you to, to be able to work with a JTAC to do the same. And that should be how you work in every domain. Figure out your JTAC equivalent to do effects uh, on behalf of your element. If you're putting a squad or a platoon into harm's way, you owe them relative superiority across all domains and joint international partners as well. That was just a catch-all for, uh, for your actual question. Anybody else want to hit that? I, I've got something on that. Hey, just uh, first of all, it's about relationships, right? I, I, I got line and block charts and the rest of that. I got it. Um, when you're dealing with NATO and other foreign partners, the line and block charts aren't going to actually work the way they're supposed to. So don't worry about it. Just move past that. Acknowledge the line and block chart, then get down to the business of building the right relationships. And by the way, to build a relationship, you actually have to give some time. You know, this can't be that you're going to stay insular in your unit because you're comfortable there. You actually have to venture out. It's usually a little uncomfortable. But I'll give you an example. I'll probably get in trouble for this because I don't know if anybody even knows we were doing this. In uh, Afghanistan, uh, you know, the Taliban are running circles around us in the information space. Why? They don't care about authorities, okay? They just do what they want to do with the, uh, with, you know, what they, can, they get up there and lie. They'll do everything on the internet. And they just uh, really have been running circles around the NATO forces for years. And we dug around a little bit and, you know, we asked for the authorities for our U.S. forces because we've got all these great capabilities, never could get those authorities. And then, no kidding, I go over and we find something in uh, a NATO entity we, we were allowed to build a troll farm, a troll farm. You guys know what a troll farm is? I mean, it's, you know, people on there arguing with the Taliban and contesting them in the space. And NATO had all the authorities. And I go, why didn't we know that before? We found them, and they were really a great capability for us. We had Afghans and the rest of it. The point is, if you don't go out there and look for it, you know, if you're kind of just worried about, hey, what's your uh, combat power you're bringing to this fight, you know, they may have some other capabilities if you, if you actually pay attention to them. They'll matter. So always just take it upon yourself. Build relationships. It goes for combined arms, too. You know, let's not, let's not kid ourselves. It's infantry and armor just getting these two guys to uh, talk to each other. That's sometimes a big feat, too, get them out in the field together. They find out they have actually a lot in common. 
when they you know get down to it. So you got to expand it. And if you're going to be a, I guess you call it multi-domain or combined arms or a joint fighter, uh, the more tools you can put in your kit bag, that matters. And I'll, I'll talk about that at the end. It matters. The tools and the ability to use them and the reps to use them matters. But if you don't go out there and explore it, you'll never know the tools you got out there. You know, hit, hit, hit CD when uh, Chris Donahue, when he gets up here and talks. He's, uh, he's actually scaring me how many tools he's putting in his kit bag nowadays. And I almost don't want him to talk to me anymore because I'm afraid he's telling me something he shouldn't be. But you know, when you, you talk to him, here's a guy that looks for every single opportunity in every relationship, and it's a real relationship. It's not a transactional relationship. But he's looking, how do you, how do you bring this together, and how do you have another capability to uh, use against your adversaries? Next question, please. Over to panel number two. Good afternoon, this is Larry. Um, I'm from Virginia Beach. Um, you've talked a little bit about um, shooting and, and physical fitness, um, but one thing you haven't mentioned is, is, is mentorship. Um, how does mentorship play in being in a big fight like you were in Somalia uh, during the fight and, and afterwards? Larry's the ringer. He's not really from Virginia Beach. He's from Fort Benning, Georgia. B Company 375 in his younger days and uh, was one of our uh, officers on the ground in Mogadishu. I forgot we had another witness here. The, uh, Larry, I, I actually turned that back around on you. You tell me what you think. You were there. Well, I didn't expect that much. Um, I think the biggest thing um, was knowing that your peers, uh, your superiors, um, your subordinates knew um, that you had their back, uh, that when you made decisions on the ground, when things were going bad all around you, uh, that uh, they were comfortable in those decisions, uh, that you were comfortable in what they were able to do. So that mentorship role that you developed in all that train up, the deployment, the six initial missions that we went on was invaluable on the 3rd and 4th of October because all those kids who were out there fighting for us really understood the impact of what they were going through. But they also knew that the leadership and those heroes that are up on stage um, were going to take care of them afterwards, take care of them, take care of their families, and uphold that responsibility that we say we're going to. We think you got it there. Hey, you asked a question on a casualty. First of all, your leadership does owe you something there. They owe you some top cover because, um, like I said, they, they're not fun. So in a traumatic event and mentorship, um, you know, first of all, a lot of people are probably sitting around when something bad has happened wondering if they screwed up. It's kind of natural. You know, you, you lose a lot of people in a single day, kind of scratching your head going, ooh, was that my fault? Um, did I do what I was supposed to do? And, uh, you know, you bl believe it or not, mentorship doesn't just come from top down. It comes from uh, within your formation. It comes from your non-commissioned officers towards you. So those are, uh, you know, if you've got that solidly built organization with the right culture, you'll get mentored from, uh, from multiple angles. And I think, uh, Larry, we saw some great cases of that. In some cases, we were scratching our heads you know, ask them where that mentorship was in, in, you know, and, you know, different parts of that, that fight. But it's a uh, leaders, you may be an introvert in the midst of something bad going on. Guess what? It's not time to yell. It's not time to go silent. It's time to get down there and uh, start figuring out how to get your arm around some people and uh, making sure they're ready to go for the next one. Okay. And there's obviously a lot more to that and leader development and mentorship but that actually matters a lot, and you guys are part of that. All right, We're, how are you guys on time? All right, so you got more than 55 seconds. I think you, you got a good ride waiting now for you. Let's go ahead and hit another question, and we'll close it out. Final question, panel number one. Good afternoon, sir, gentlemen, Anthony Randall, Rangers lead the way. Sir, thank you for bringing this topic to our attention today. 
each of you shared the essentialness of developing character attributes that build the warrior soul and the warrior ethos. And many of us have had the privilege to serve alongside you. Thank you for your transparency in your stories today because you brought there with us. So my question for you and for the gentlemen at the table is some people in here may think, man, I don't know if I could ever sit at that table because of what I'm wrestling with today. How have the five of you walked the walk that you've walked and still today build anti-fragility? You come back and you get better. How have you continued to build your warrior's soul after the trauma? And my second question to you, if you could be transparent with us, is what hasn't worked? Where have you fallen short and how have you gotten better? Thank you. Yeah, that's a, uh, that's a penetrating question. I should have figured you're going to ask that. So I'll immediately toss it over to these guys to uh, answer it <laughs> because they don't have much time. Um, if, if, if you will, if you, want, if, if you want to, take a shot at it, and I'll close it, okay? Jeplin, thank you for that question. The, uh, the, the beauty of the, the unit and the, and the most units we all serve in is that I, I no kidding uh, for resiliency and building anti-fragility and why I do it is I get to serve with the, uh, the men and women I admire most in the world. And it, it's not, uh, um, you know, guys like Brett Johnson, Sergeant Major Pouillat, Sergeant Major Nash, just because they're in the room, they're amongst them. My, my pantheon of heroes is Ranger non-commissioned officers who, uh, living up to their expectations, makes me rise as a professional, as a man, as a ranger. Um, and that's why I keep coming back to this unit. I think it's a great privilege. I also got a very uh, supportive family that's kind of fully invested in, in our lifestyle. We all look out for each other. Uh, the places where I've come short are, uh, are, are, are typically any time I go too far, focused on the professional at the detriment of paying attention to my family. And I, and I try to, even in this job, I try to make that work by uh, putting a simple routine things in to make sure I'm home for dinner. I don't sacrifice too many weekends. Um, but Brett's always told me how I'm coming up short on that still, so I'll pass over to Brett. So I would say the same thing. You know, growing up, my father told me, surround yourself with positive people and positive things happen. You surround yourself with negative things and negative things happen. Uh, I went to college and played baseball. I surrounded myself with negative things and uh, ended up in the Army. And then, <laughs> <laughs> no kidding, no kidding. I would make bad decisions in the, uh, out, out in college, and then it's like I'm, I'm, I'm joining the Army. Uh, joined the army and and found like uh, I, you know, I had I had a phenomenal squad leader, phenomenal squad leader. That's what, I think that's where it starts with like the good the good leaders that like show you what right looks like every day. My first two squad leaders not that great. My my third squad leader ser currently serving up before Bragg, uh, you know goes by the name of uh, Cranky Craig Bishop. He uh, he was he was what right looked like every single day. And uh, and sh and showed me how to be a non-commissioned officer. I, I was like, I'm I'm sold. Uh, and then I I married up. I absolutely married up, and she is my biggest critic. I, it doesn't matter what my what horrible counseling statements I got from Sergeant Major Bishop and everybody else along the way. Uh, my my wife is is the one that's like, you screwed that up. You should have not said that, right? Uh, and and she is the most honest person in our, that I could ever imagine to be. And uh, so. You know, those are the things that, that keep, she definitely keeps me grounded. And then uh, I would tell you, you know, the relationship that, uh, that you build with your commander as our, our six o'clock meetings over a cup of coffee and, hey, what are we doing great and what are we not doing great and what do we need to focus on is important. And we, we recalibrate ourselves every, every single day and, and then we go out and do PT. You know, Anthony, it's good to see you. Hey, sir, thank you for the question. Uh, for me, I never wanted to do anything else. I knew from about my sophomore year of high school that the military was gonna be my career path, or I hoped it was gonna be my career path. Uh, I came in and I realized that uh, everyone was better than me. Uh, so I had to work hard every day just to meet those bare minimum standards that my peers and my teammates expected of me. Uh, and after about eight years, I got out, uh, I went to college, got my education, I realized that those people didn't meet my expectations. So I went ahead and rejoined the Army just in time for 9-11, lucky me. 
Uh, and I work with guys like Sergeant Major Nash, Sergeant Major Pouliot, Sergeant Major Merritt that's out here, Larry and other guys. Uh, saw General Miller quite a few times overseas as he would fly in to check in on us and make sure you know, we were doing things right. Um, so for me, the balance was working hard every day to make sure that I was the guy that my guys deserved. Uh, making sure if you're a leader and you're not tired at the end of the day, I, I think you're doing it wrong. And you probably didn't get done everything that day that you needed to do. And then you got to wake up tomorrow and do it all over again. Uh, a great NCO that many of you will know, Sergeant Major Birch, when I took my first platoon, I asked him, I was like, Sergeant Major, what's a piece of advice before I take my first platoon? What can you give me? And he's like, people skills. It's the first duty position for an NCO where you have an officer counterpart. And you have to take that officer and you have to make him your teammate. And you have to have a collective vision that you have to sell to your squad leaders and get them on board. And then you have to sell your platoon to the company chain of command so that you guys are always the first pick for any mission that comes down the chute. Uh, so waking up every day and just trying to hope that I worked hard enough to be that NCO that my people deserved. And I know I fell short more times than I succeeded. Uh, as far as wives go, I definitely married up. And a lot of the guys out here know my wife. So <laughs> without a doubt, she is sarcastic. Uh, she will call me out and she likes to do it in front of people just so that I know my shortcomings. Um, my children, it, it's hard for you to not look at your kids and need to succeed for them so that they look at you and see what hard work looks like. Not to look at you and see what love looks like because my dad loves me and the reason he does the job he does is because it's his way of contributing to keep me safe and my friends safe and my family safe. So that's my answer, sir. And we're trying to get you out of here, I, I promise you. Yeah, we're trying to get them out of here, yeah. Um, hey, real, real quick, I got one minute and I'm gonna give it back to General Miller. But, um, you know, you all have stories out there. The successful marriages out there will admit that we married up, okay? So just, just admit that to yourself right now and just drive on, all right? And if, 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 if you do that, your relationship will be a lot better. 18-year-old kid, wanted to be a certified public accountant. What a stupid decision I've ever made in my life. Lasted six months, went to the Army, and in 1976, in bicentennial year, didn't understand why these Vietnam vets wanted to go back to war. And it took me many years to get to a war. And then Panama and Desert Shield, Desert Storm, um, once you get to war, you understand why Vietnam vets wanted to go back to war. Because that is where the soldier, that is where the warrior is the most prosperous and the most uh, trained and the most um, hard-hitting person will be the most successful in the war. And then as you get back and fight the war and, and fight to train and fight to do better in the war, there's two sides of us. I'll tell you this right now. There's one side that could be a French Foreign Legion guy. I could go to war, I could go fight a battle, and I could fight for a worthy cause. All right, the other side of me is, a, is an appreciative and understanding dad and a husband. That you have to balance that as you go through your career. And those of us that were successful have something left at the end of your career. So you should try to do the same. Hey, JD and Brett, you guys aren't walking out on me, but go ahead and get over there and pa pass or pass on to Jack Harmon, okay? All right. Hey, first of all, that's a, uh, that is a great question. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to close this out. It, it's a great question, and uh, not to criticize this distinguished panel. We talked around it a little bit, okay? You asked the question, how do we stay anti-fragile? Maybe we don't. You know, that's the other flip side of this. Maybe we just pretend quite a lot that we are not fragile and we're very resilient and nothing bothers us. And uh, if we look across the force, we got to pay attention to that. And it's a, uh, you know, it's not just the weak, weak people commit suicide, weak people break down. There's, there's a problem out here. We know that. You may have it in your platoon. You may be experiencing something. And, uh, you know, everybody just has this thing of, you know, put on the, uh, put on the grimace, move forward, and just, just deal with it. So, you know, again, no one up here wants to go, yeah, I'm fragile. Um, but I will tell you this, okay, and I'll be, I'll be very transparent, and I know with at least one of these guys up here, in transition, things are different than when you were on active duty. 
And if you look at our population that's transitioned, by the way, transition is not just retired four stars. You know, soldiers who leave the, uh, leave the force, it's officers who, you know, do their five and they get out and they start moving on to something else, but it's different. And I would just tell you, don't ever underestimate the power of the tribe you're sitting in right now and the power of that support system. It's real. It's real. Um, and I say that as somebody who's transitioned. I'm very attuned to the population right now. And so, but you do it, you know, when you talk about resilience, it's a, um, you know, it is shared hardship. It's care. I mean, you could actually go right down the Army values and you start putting those pieces together and you could talk about them. Um, but I will tell you, I do believe leadership is the key to a healthy force. You know, where do we get in trouble with sexual assault and the rest of it? We kind of screw it up. We screw it up and it just gets worse and worse and worse and it spirals down and it rips units apart. And you kind of sit there and you scratch your head and you go, did we not see that as leaders early on? Were we not paying attention to? And sexual assault's only one of them, okay? But that's one that's on, uh, certainly on people's mind. And I'll tell you, if you have that kind of crap going on in your unit, your war fighting skills will be diminished as a, as a unit. It just will be. So hard question, and again, thank you for assuming we're anti-fragile. I kind of like to still think about that from time to time. But there is the reality that, you know, we got some problems within the force, and, and leaders got to be there as the sensors to detect it. And usually it's just by talking to your people, trying to understand, baseline this, and understand what you're seeing as you go forward. Hey, I'm going to close out. Uh, first of all, this is the ethos of combat. Um, I love coming to Fort Benning as old home week. Again, like I said, I've got infantry and armor commandants under my, uh, you know, when I was here, you know, both doing great things in the uh, military. I saw Peter Jones who took your place, uh, you know, earlier in the day here. I'm looking across here at a lot of familiar faces. I know some of the young people. I think we've got some uh, I Bullock and A Bullock people that I've crossed paths with, but I'm just like stunned by all the people I've had the opportunity to work with. Um, we used to have a little bit of a phrase here, actually, a, I don't know what it was a phrase. It's a couple of words, and it was talking about what we wanted from our leaders at Fort Benning. We wanted them to be smart. We wanted them to be fast. We wanted them to be lethal. We wanted them to be precise. And everyone goes, okay, what's that mean? Okay, you can apply that individually. You can apply that collectively. Smart, hey, guys, you're leaders. I expect you to know a lot. How do you know a lot? You get good training. You get good mentorship. But you also put some effort into. You know a lot. And uh, you just have to acknowledge some of it, to know a lot, sometimes it takes a little bit of time. But you at least have the foundation where you are really smart. You certainly ought to be smarter than your adversary. You don't go stumbling into bad situations where you lose entire units because you just didn't, you know, didn't pay attention to anything in the lay of land. Fast. Expect you to be really fast. Expect you to be gunslingers. I don't care what your weapon system is. I expect you to be faster than your adversary. I expect you to be cognitively fast. How do you do that? That's not just kind of studying. That's actually a lot of reps. It's a lot of reps, uh, you know, on gunslinging. It's a lot of reps on decision making. It's putting yourself over and over into these situations that require you to cognitively move fast. I love staffs that can move fast. You give me a staff that plods, I'll, I'll walk away from that staff and grab three people and we'll go plan the operation ourselves. You know, I want, I want fast, you know, speed, not sacrificing all the other capabilities, all the things that go along with it, but because of your ability and your reps, you're really fast. Uh, lethal, you know, I've already talked about that. You aim, you shoot, you decide to pull the trigger, should be a hit, first round hits. You know, I'm actually kind of curious, um, you know, the lieutenants and the sergeants in the room specifically. Adam Red Cloud, uh, you got some guys showing, the next gen squad weapons are out there. They ought to be out there, Larry. You ought to go pick them up and shoot them. It's a new cartridge. Um, Enhanced capability, I guess the Army says you can't, I can't talk about muzzle velocity and, and distances and the rest of it, but it's uh, also a heavier weapon. It's actually a, uh, you know, a rifle, replace the M4, and also a uh, replacement for the squad automatic weapon, which I think the squad automatic weapon replacement's lighter, so that the gunners will like that, but the uh, people who have to carry a heavier weapon need to know why they're carrying a heavier weapon. If you're actually properly trained on it, it makes good sense to carry that heavy weapon. If you're not, just carrying a heavy weapon. Uh, but it's also, if you guys are out here and you got, you know, time in, uh, in the day, I'd certainly get out there. There's a guy named Jason St. John who's a uh, 
old 375 guy who who's, knows an awful lot about weapon systems and can walk you through that. But wouldn't it be nice if you got out to your platoons and explain to them what's getting ready to go, happen to them? Um, and then precision. You know, we can't be sloppy. We just can't. You know, whether it's CivCAS or, or anything, we, we cannot not afford to be sloppy. You know, nothing is the price of combat, in my mind. It's not, you pay, you, when you start taking that attitude, you pay for that years later. You know, the precision actually matters because the majority, recognizing we have an international crowd in here, this is the U.S. military. And the U.S. military is uh, precise in its actions. And it's, uh, you know, go, goes with and understands the law of armed conflict, combat ethics, and the rest of it. But at the same time, expectation is that we fight and win the nation's wars. Guys, thank you very much. I appreciate it.